Good evening, everyone. My name is Mike Mazio, and I am the Dean of WashU Olin. Uh, as of September 1st, so uh, this is one of my first opportunities to uh, thank you. Thank you very much. It's it's just my first week, and I'm thrilled to um, be welcoming you to our first leadership perspectives event of this academic year. Tonight, we're going to revisit a couple of the compelling stories from our On Principle podcast. I have a, just a couple of things to cover before we dive into uh, Kurt and the program today. Um, Wash you all and is proud to bring the leadership perspective series. It's a set of illuminating discussions with, uh, like today, an impressive lineup of speakers from various different uh, perspectives. And in a moment, you'll meet Kurt, our moderator, our panelists, and hear their stories of resilience and leadership. Uh, WashU is a community of people who's dedicated to pursuing new ideas and taking on challenges. Uh, events like this allow us to contribute meaningful thoughts and ideas to the marketplace and to bring kind of as a, as a gateway ideas around innovation and I think in this case, uh, inspiration as well. Um, our event today uh, centers on leading through challenges, even personal, uh, even personal challenges. Two of our panelists, one senior leader and one up and coming junior executive uh, are gonna recount and update stories that they shared in the uh, On Principle podcast. A at the core of each story is the importance of well-being, belonging, and presenting one's full self in the workplace. Uh, we also have a faculty member, Hannah is here uh, on the panel, who will add context and insights uh, to the discussion. Thank you uh, to all the panelists for joining us uh, here tonight. In a moment, you will meet them in more detail. Uh, but first, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator, Kurt Greenbaum. Kurt is the director of communications for Olin's marketing and communication team. Uh, Kurt is an experienced journalist who's worked at several news outlets before moving to St. Louis uh, as the online news director for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Uh, he joined our marketing and communication team in 2017 after working at the consortium in addition to managing the business school's annual alumni magazine and our blog, Kurt is the host and writer for uh, the On Principle podcast, which just began, congratulations, season number uh, four uh, this year. Uh, Kurt has interviewed uh, both of our panelists uh, for the podcast, as I mentioned, and tonight he's going to dig a little bit deeper into their unique stories, including what's happened uh, since their episode was released. After today's discussion, our guests will answer a few questions. Uh, for the virtual audience, we invite you to submit questions as well. Please use the Q&A feature on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, to Kurt and our distinguished panel, thank you for sharing your powerful stories. I'm going to now turn it over to Kurt to introduce our speakers and uh, get the conversations going. Thank you very much. For me, it was this understanding that there's no way that I could really be successful in this. Like, I am a fraud and everyone's going to figure it out. I'm going to lose my job and all of my credibility and it's going to go down the drain. And that was what I was hearing in my voice day in and day out. Just a simple picture of my real calendar. And it was a real appointment, which simply said mental health appointment. And it went on Twitter. And then, you know, I think it's fair to say that kind of kicked off in a pretty strong way and started perhaps the most terrifying three days of my life. 
From Olin Business School at Washington University in St. Louis, I'm Kurt Greenbaum, and this is our first Leadership Perspectives event of the year. Thank you all for being here. I'm so happy to see you, and I'm so happy to welcome our online audience as well. Thank you for joining us also. Um, as Dean Mazio said, I'm Kurt Greenbaum, and I said it myself just a second ago. Uh, I am the host of On Principle, our podcast, and I'm thrilled also to be your moderator here this evening. Uh, and to welcome everybody on our panel. So we'll just uh, get right to it and introduce everybody. Uh, each of our panelists has a story about a pivotal moment in their work life. Um, sometimes we like to call those oh shoot moments, which is kind of the trademark of the On Principle podcast. Um, although their stories are very different, um, they, they all can share stories focused on the idea of belonging, well-being, presenting our authentic selves, and um, all, our guests will also have some um, perspectives on how to create a culture that fosters that sense of belonging and, and well-being, uh, which leads to better outcomes and better pro productivity. So our guests, um, these are going to be very short intros so we can get right to the meat of the matter, uh, but you can read more about their bios by visiting the Leadership Perspectives page on our website. So first, let me introduce Kendra Kelly. Uh, Kendra is the Director of Marketing for the U.S. Face and Lip Makeup Business for Lancome, one of the beauty brands for L'Oreal. Uh, Kendra started with L'Oreal in 2021 as Chief of Staff to the President of L'Oreal USA's Lux Division after earning her MBA here at Olin Business School. Next, I'll go to the other end of the, of the line and introduce Hannah Birnbaum. Uh, Hannah earned her PhD uh, in management and organizations from Kellogg Business School, and I bring that up because that's where our new dean also came here from. Um, she's an assistant professor of organizational behavior and my colleague here at Wash U Olin Business School. Um, she studies the factors that undermine the success of diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives in organizations and investigates how leaders can create more diverse and inclusive organizations. And finally, our third guest is Mike Minahan. Uh, Mike is a four-star general and commander of the Air Force's Air Mobility Command based at Scott Air Force Base. Uh, about, it's about 110,000 uh, airmen fall under your command. And see if I get this right. Your command includes working on air transport of people and cargo, aerial refueling operations, aeromedical evacuation and the operation of maintenance facilities and ports around the globe. Did you I get that You did it right? better than I could have. Oh, well, fantastic. All right, so let's, let's get in and set the scene with some of the situations that uh, uh, Kendra and the general have confronted. And can we start with you, Kendra? Sure. So some background. Kendra started her MBA and then there was the pandemic. And she was, she had received an offer for an internship with L'Oreal. And ultimately, L'Oreal ended up canceling its internships that pandemic summer. But then a year later, you renewed that relationship with L'Oreal and they wanted to bring you aboard. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what that was like joining that organization. Um, you were there with other people who had had previous experience in internships, is that right? Yes. So traditionally, MBA internship, you, you know, you work so hard to get this internship. You work so hard during your internship to land the full time offer. And for L'Oreal, the chiefs of staff that were uh, brought on for that full time offer were all um, previous interns who received the full time offer. And so they come in knowing about the industry. They come in knowing about simple things like how L'Oreal reports its numbers, how they speak. I used to joke, well, it wasn't a joke. I thought truly I was going to need to learn French to be able to be successful at L'Oreal and to have a long standing career as a business leader. Little did I know I needed to learn how to speak L'Oreal. I would be just OK speaking English, but I needed to learn how to speak L'Oreal. And that is something that interns, you know, come in knowing. And so it was a tough transition. Um, the learning curve was steep and it was one that um, was riddled with, in my case, imposter syndrome and 
great doubt over my capabilities, but um, it was a it was a challenging transition to be there and to be the first of its kind chief of staff in that you know did not have an internship offer um, and came in out the gate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you used the word the phrase imposter syndrome. There's another phrase you used with me when we talked about my little friend. My little friend. <laughs> yes. Um, can you talk about where that phrase comes from for you? Yes, I have to talk about it kind of in jest, otherwise, you know, it'll kind of take me over and we don't want that. So my little friend, um, it's been with me for a while. I think really ever since I graduated from undergrad and was working as a professional straight out of undergrad, I felt it. Um, and I think at times it's been the result of my environment at L'Oreal, it has not been the result of my environment, which is really great. But, you know, for me, it's, it's this, voice in my head that tells me you can't do it you're not good enough you're not supposed to be there it's a mistake um, and so i've had to work really hard throughout my career um, and throughout my adult life to combat it um, but it certainly came to a head at, at l'oreal okay i want to come back and talk a little bit more about that sure but let's move to uh mike and and let me ask you um so you you've been involved in the air force since 1990 right Correct. Yeah, uh, and rose steadily through the ranks over the years in a variety of different roles. Got your MBA at some point. We talked about that earlier. Um, and then it was about two years ago you took over the command at Scott Air Force Base, the Air Mobility Command. And when we spoke for the podcast, you talked about the first meeting that you had with members of the senior staff and others in your command including a retired chief named Brinkley. Can you talk a little bit about Certainly. that meeting? Um, I've got a lot of experience um, serving in the Pacific Theater, um, whether it was in Hawaii or Korea in multiple different organizations. And so one of the reasons that I was chosen uh, for this job was because of that experience, um, you know, both handling the vastness of that area of responsibility, but also uh, the challenges that come along with that, you know, uh, whether you think um, uh, about China or North Korea, there's there's challenges there. And and I was brought in to um, to bring that experience and and to get the team ready to take on those challenges. One of the challenges we need to take on is um, is making sure that all aspects of an individual are ready for what that may look like. So we call it warrior heart. Warrior heart is mind, body, craft. And we understood very early that, that we need to bring the mind up to the same level as body and craft. So we don't think anything about going to a gym to improve our fitness or going to a doctor when we're not feeling well. We don't think anything, uh, and that's, that's obviously body. When it comes to craft, we do lots of training evolutions. Uh, tailored to the individual, tailored on the team to provide the best possible outcomes. Yet we normally treat the mind like it's uh, like it's not convenient to talk about. Um, and normally it's an emergency room type of visit as opposed to just a, a touch and go um, you know type of type of issue where we every other part of our life is described that way. So how do you elevate mind up and provide that strength in advance? of what may happen when it comes to the challenges that our nation faces. So Chief Brinkley called me out and he said, Menahan, if you care about mental health, put it on your calendar. And I said, Roger, and I'm certain we'll get to this later, but it took me about uh, two months to generate that courage. Well, I was gonna ask you, the, the very <laughs> next day you put it on your calendar, right? Not, not so much, um, <laughs> not so much. Um, so that conference was in front of all our commanders where I had the crews in front of us that had executed the evacuation of Kabul. Kabul. So very intimate interaction with what it means to do something very dangerous on behalf of your nation. And you all have seen the pictures of 124,000 uh, evacuees, 17 days, one runway, uh, only this nation could do that. Um, but to back away from that once the emotions die down of the actual uh, you know, operation and you see the impact that that made on those airmen that, that, uh, that executed that, the impact it made on the families of those airmen 
that impact on that. And I'll just tell you as a commander, it was very apparent to me that we need to put a lot of attention on, on, on the mind part of mind body craft. So Chief Brinkley challenged me, put it on the calendar. I did, I realized nobody could see that but four people, three of them are sitting in the room right now. And so I took a bold step into something I'm very uncomfortable with, which is the social media aspect with, uh, and, and we put it on the tweet. And as I described in the podcast with you, that started the most three terrifying days of my life. So I want to I want to come back to that and I want to bring Hannah into the conversation here. So you said it took you about two months to get to the point where you could actually do it. And then um, and then uh, three days of terror, as you described it, when it was made public on Twitter. Hannah, I want to ask you when you hear that in the story. Um, we know mental health challenges are still stigmatized in the workplace. Is this an area. Why is this so the case? Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, and, and, and other a, changes too. But. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a mental health expert, but I do know that organizational change is really, really challenging, right? And uh, we can see the challenges can come from both uh, the institutional or the structural level, right? Are there enough resources? Is there real investment in this initiative that an organization is trying to get to? And it sounds like there was. Um, but then you actually need individuals to buy in to the initiative, right? You need people to feel like the initiative aligns with their personal goals um, and that leadership is really doing this for genuine reasons, not for performative reasons. Uh, one of the things that I really love what you said is you called it warrior heart, what, right? Warrior heart. Yeah. Warrior heart. And that's a really beautiful, uh, a beautiful way to describe it because it aligns with perhaps um, you know the culture that you're already in that you are warriors right and so when we when we take initiatives that we want to put forward and we make sure that they align with what the culture of the organization already looks like they tend to be more successful mm -hmm. so uh, the way also you posted your tweet um, what did you you said what did you say? Well, let's let's okay. take a look we'll, at it. We'll wait. Can we oh, bring yes. that up on the screen? Um, this is a picture of uh, the tweet that uh, the general sent out on, uh, I, I can't remember, I, I believe this, it was sent on uh, in February of 2022. Mm -hmm. Exactly, right. So calling it Warrior Heart specifically is a really effective strategy to get people bought in to this aligns with a larger organizational culture. Thank you. So great job. <laughs> and, and so there you see that the, the, the tweet and down at the bottom is where the, um, the mental health appointment is. Um, I wonder, and I think we can go ahead and put the other screen back up. Um, why was it three days of terror for you? Yeah. I am social media shy. The, the people that surround me now would argue against that, but I really, I really am social media shy. So um, the tweet went out on a Friday. I woke up early Saturday morning. I'm, I'm a pretty early to bed guy and an early riser. And, you know, I realized that, you know, the term I think viral, you know, that it was cooking off uh, at a pretty good clip. I was actually upset that the word heart wasn't capitalized. So I was calling my PA, uh, which is my public affairs team. And I was like, hey, you know, we need to go back and fix it. And they're like, too late, it's out of control. You can't, it's, there's no taking this one back or fixing it. Um, but, but I instantly went down um, into the comments and started reading them, which is why I'm social media shy because there's the good, the bad and the ugly and everything that comes with anonymous feedback there. Um, but I certainly got a, got a real sense very early that I put myself out in a very exposed kind of way. People would question why I did it. They would wonder if I had the cap uh, capacity to perform the duties of which I have been, uh, you know, given the authority to do. They would, um, they would wonder if I had an angle. They would make comments like, of course, you're a general, you'll get an appointment. You know, I'm, an, I'm, I'm someone junior and I've been waiting for an appointment for two weeks. So all those things were in there. And so I quit reading it. What got me through those three days was certainly, uh, if you wanna know what a five-star general looks like, that's my wife right there, uh, my family. Um, and then the comments that were coming in from 
email sources and phone calls and texts that were very supportive, soon followed by personal stories. And I think I shared a few of those on the podcast were very, very powerful that continue to this day, uh, by the way. The last one happened in Home Depot, of all places. Mm -hmm. Just checking out, asked for my military. I, I, I requested my discount. Um, <laughs> she looked at my ID card and she said, hey, you're that, you're that guy that did the tweet. She goes, that was awesome. I mean, so, I mean, just a subtle touch out in this yeah. community um, that shows you that the impact is, is there. So, you know, it, it's really, I guess, if I had to fine tune it, I would say, you know, I really felt that I had put myself out. Um, it exposed myself was probably where that terrifying adjective comes mm -hmm. from. Well, I want to come back and ask um, in a minute why Chief Brinkley threw that challenge down to you. But before we do, Let's talk about you, Kendra, and sort of how the visitor affected you, your, your little friend affected you and your work as you were getting your career launched at L'Oreal. Um, well, I think it's very similar to what I mentioned before in that I just had this nagging voice in my head. Um, and I think because of that, I'm someone who takes a lot of pride in my, in my work, and so I I'm also a Virgo, if anyone knows anything about astrology. We, we strive for perfection, and it's terrible. I heard that woo, and I appreciate it. The five star um, right there is a Virgo. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> I really knew I liked you, Ashley. I did. Um, but, you know, it's, um, we know that perfection, I know that perfection is not real, right? Don't let, uh, what is it? Perfect, perfect the way be the of enemy good. of good. Is that yeah. it? Um, so I really do. Um, I, I make sure that I keep that in mind. But because of this imposter syndrome, I was really trying to work towards everything being perfect, which is inefficient at the end of the day. And beauty moves so quickly. Our industry is so competitive. Um, you know, you really have to be on your A game every single day. Chief of staff, the role in and of itself, every day is an interview because you want to graduate from the program. And um, upon successfully graduating from the program, you become a director of marketing with you know, a huge PL and the dream, uh, the dream that led me to business school in the first place. And so, you know, I, I really wanted to master this chief of staff, my time as chief of staff. But because of the imposter syndrome, I very much wasn't doing my best work. It ended up being like a self-fulfilling prophecy almost of, I can't do this. I'm not supposed to be here. And then all of a sudden I was just not doing as well as I could. I felt it in my spirit. Um, and that's because I hold myself to a high standard. So I know what I can accomplish and what I can achieve. And so when I wasn't doing that, I just felt terrible. And then I started spiraling. Um, and then I started to get into a pretty challenging place from a mental health perspective. Um, and so it really did just lead to this downward spiral. And I finally realized, wait a second, through, I will say I had therapy, all of that, but through um, different forms of treatment realized I need to be better at how I'm talking to myself. Um, my environment isn't telling me this. My manager, I sat her down and asked for a very candid review. And she was not telling me that I was underperforming. She was not telling me that I was not living up to her standards. Um, and so I realized, wait a second, this is coming from me. Um, and since it's coming from me, this is something that I can change. I just need the tools to be able to do it. And the first tool is speaking positively to myself. I hope that doesn't sound trivial to anyone because it's a lot harder than it sounds. Um, but I had to treat myself like I treat my best friends. And that is with kindness, that is with patience, that is with empathy, and that is with grace. So I wanna also come back to that conversation you had with your leader at the time. But before we do, Hannah, when we talked, it was not, you, you, you're not fond of the phrase imposter syndrome, right? Yes, yes. Uh... And with, do, with respect, <laughs> It isn't just her, right? Yes. Can you talk about that? Sure, yeah. So um, 
this, it actually started when, when researchers began uh, thinking about these feelings, these feelings of fraud, these feelings that you'll find out. The original term was actually the imposter phenomenon. And the reason it was called that, and the reason I use that term instead of syndrome, is because it places the burden or the responsibility of these feelings not within, oops, an individual, right? It's not you as an individual having this syndrome that we need to fix. Rather, thinking about it as a phenomenon makes us consider how our context or how um, the beliefs that we hold might change, right? Um, and we can kind of alter the context or we can not always have these feelings of self-doubt. So uh, I think it, it, it's the same, right? Uh, and a lot of people experience these, these questions of self-doubt, uh, that people will find out that you're a fraud, that you're not actually as smart as you are, uh, that the accomplishment of graduating from a wonderful business school like Olin isn't as impressive as it actually is. Yeah, well, and to that point, I want to just point out, right, Kendra is somebody who, by the way, the podcast exists in part because Kendra did some very early market research for us while she was a business school student. Um, she worked for the Obama campaign before business school. Um, she was a member of a task force here at the school involved in laying the groundwork for a DEI strategy. Um, she was the president of the uh, um, Student Government Association here. Um, her classmates elected her to be the speaker at their graduation. So forgive me for embarrassing you with all of that. But th the idea is, to, I'm just trying to make the point that this is an interesting phenomenon um, that, that people are confronted with. Um, and I, I, first of all, can you talk a little bit about that? And then can you talk about your conversation with your leader a little bit more? Sure. You know, as I started to realize like, okay, you're part of this is negative self-talk. I did have a moment where I kind of listed out a lot of my accomplishments and I looked at that list and <laughs> um, I had to laugh at myself. I really did. Cause I was like, who, how dare you say these things to yourself? How dare you put yourself down? Um, I worked very hard to get into a great business school and you know, came here on a fellowship through the consortium and you know, none of these things just happened out of the blue. They happened with hard work and persistence. Um, but I think in those moments, for some reason, still, your accomplishments just don't mean as much. Um, it's challenging to articulate, honestly, but um, I could, once I was in a better place, I could look at that list and say, oh, Kendra. But when I was in the throes of it, that list wouldn't have helped very much, to be honest. Well, part of what but compels me about the conversation you had with your leader about that, and as you tell the story, you were very candid with her. Look, I'm struggling here. Yeah. I need to know um, how you feel like I'm doing. Yes. And I loved how she contrasted your style of work with some of the other people that you were working with and made you understand that that was okay. Am I characterizing that about right? Yeah, so um, my style, this is in large part having worked in politics, but my, my work style, if you will, is one of um, working very meticulously um, and also trying to think like 10 steps ahead it's this kind of living in the contingency planning zone. <laughs> what will go wrong is something that I think about just as much as I think about what could go really, 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 really well. Um, and I still work like that. And so that can slow you down, especially in an environment where people aren't thinking like that necessarily, that you know, I was worried that I may be seen as a Debbie Downer, negative Nancy, devil's advocate, all of the, all of the things. Um, but that's just the way my brain works. And 
oftentimes it's, it's for good. <laughs> you need someone in the room thinking about contingency plans. Um, well, she made you understand that. Right? And she did. She did. And so, you know, she said to me, part of the reason why she values the program is because it takes people who have such different life experiences, brings them into this company and allows them to take their transferable skills, mold, blend them with the skills that are necessary at L'Oreal to be successful. Um, and it creates a different leader, a different style of leader. Um, and so that is, that's something that I really took to heart. And I was so grateful that she was uh, just so transparent and, and helped me understand what you think is a flaw is actually an X factor and you should really lean into that. I want to turn back to you, Mike, and ask you again about, can you, can you talk about sort of what was underlying the chief's um, suggestion to you that you make that uh, appointment? I, may I comment? Oh, of course. Okay. Yeah. Because I thought, I thought uh, Kendra's podcast was incredible. And connecting, you know, the two months that it took me to generate the courage with with her journey, you know, the, the courage to have the tough discussion with yourself. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a, a critical piece of this. And so, you know, I think, you know, even before you've made the action, just the fact that you're courageous enough to do that is, is just absolutely incredible. Um, the courage to then have that conversation with yourself and turn it into an action that not only benefits the individual, but also, um, you know, the corporation or the, or the team or the, you know, how you, whatever level up it is. I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's new level kind of stuff there. And when I heard that story, I thought, man, your supervisor manager is an amazing person. She is. <laughs> and that's exactly the reaction that I would hope that any one of my supervisor airmen would have in reaction to, you know, someone that approached them with the same concern. I mean, she showed a lot of grace to you and the organization, but you also showed a lot of grace to yourself. And I, th I thought that was very powerful. Chief Brinkley, you got to know Chief Brinkley. He is fiery. He is demanding. He is, you know, chiefs in the United States Air Force are the pride of the Air Force. They're the highest rank. Uh, and they, they get there through demonstrated grit, leadership, tenacity, courage, all of it. And they represent not just the Air Force, but the enlisted corps, which is the corps that gets, gets all the work done. And, and so he's fiery and demanding. And it doesn't matter especially since he's retired, what rank you are. I mean, he's going to treat you like, uh, like he's the chief and he's going to chief you around. Two things. I would say the chief put me on notice in front of everybody for two reasons. One, <laughs> and I just thought of this because when you teased it, I think he knew I could take it. I think that guy, I've been around, I've, I've served with him. I've known him for over a decade. He's a friend of mine, but he knew he he I, he perhaps saw something in me that knew that I could take the weight of the effort there, which would be disproportional. Um, you know, both in the neg it could perhaps be some negative part of that, and then he knew I could also probably had a high potential to close and to not just be someone who could talk the talk but back it up with with walking the walk. So. Um, you know, what I've learned, and this gets back to a comment that was made earlier about organizational change, and especially in this role, is that you, there's really, really three W's to get to the fourth W. You've got to will things in, in, into existence. You, you've got to have the intestinal fortitude to will things into existence. You have got to wither the internal resistance, and you have got to weather the personal and professional attacks. I mean, that's just the way it is right now. And and, and if you can do all those, then you can win. And win could be establishing the climate, uh, the culture that you need within the organization. Winning to me looks like uh, a strong military that's able to carry out the orders of our civilian leadership. Bottom line, what we are subservient to them, they decide what we do, and I owe them a force that's ready. 
you know, regardless of the challenge, I owe them a force that's ready. And not just ready, but ready to win. And, um, and you know, the journey is tough on this one. Um, you know, there is plenty to will into existence. There is plenty to wither. And there is certainly a lot to weather when it comes to the, you know, what it means to really change things. So I think to, to put a crisp bow on this, it would be Chief Saw that perhaps I could do all those W's mm. and, and deliver a win. Well, and I think, as you and I talked earlier, he, he also knows the reality of uh, mental health right. of, among members of the military, veterans, um, the rate of suicide among yeah. the, these populations yep. and whatnot. And so normalizing mental health sounds like it was something that he really it's, wanted I, to make I, sure. It's as simple and as hard as elevating mind to the same level as body and craft, mm. eliminating the stigma, lowering the barriers and increasing access and options. When you see the warriors that executed the Kabul withdrawal, and these are America's sons and daughters. Mm -hmm. And when they say, I'm not sleeping, I'm having nightmares, it's affecting my relationships. I mean, as a commander, that's on me. And so there is nothing uh, beneath any of us in a headquarters that um, you know, in, in the actions to, to, to provide that climate, that culture, because I need them. First of all, I appreciate what they did for this country, but I need them, you know, mm -hmm. I need them healthy. I need them happy. I need them ready. Sure. And, um, and, and so when, when it comes to that, I mean, there's, there's no action that, that is left unchecked. Well, um, when, we, when we talked for the podcast, you were gracious enough to allow me to ask you an impertinent question. Certainly. That, that I'm going to ask you again. Okay. Which is... Um, I don't know what impertinent needs, but I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, you put up an appointment that said mental health appointment on your calendar. Right. You could not just do that to check a box, right? right? And I wonder if you would mind talking a little bit about... Certainly. Um, you know, and, you, and I, I just noticed when it was up there, it said parking TBD. <laughs> Um, to be determined. Um, I know the military is full of acronyms, but, um, you know, so I was first approach, like, hey, where do you want us to park? You, I mean, I, I drive a distinctive vehicle. Um, it's got, you know, it's got the military stuff on it so that you would know that I was in it. Um, and they wanted to put me in a parking spot behind the hospital, walk me in through the back, up through a back staircase to the to the to where the mental health appointment was. And so, you know, I decided to go park park in the front, walk in that door, take that elevator, sit in that waiting room, uh, fill out the paperwork, the computer, um, my name called, you know, all that around, um, you know, airmen, family members, all, all that. And so. What, what I didn't know is that I did not know the distance between saying it's okay to seek help and then actually doing that. Uh, I have been a champion of mental health for decades in, in my career. I have stood on a stage in front of thousands and thousands of people and said, seeking help is a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness. That there is nothing that this Air Force won't do for you and your family should you need help. Um, but I could not at all appreciate what it really meant to go through that process until I did it. And then what I found is once you get through the waiting room, the computer uptake, the oral uptake, and back to the professional that's trained to help you is that it's like the talk we're having right now. It's, it's liberating. And I think I described it on the podcast is what I thought I was doing for my airmen. I found out I was doing for me too. And you know, when uh, these professionals are very good at getting to the heart of the problem very quickly, and you just unpack, you know, will anything significant happen in your life? No, not really. You know, really? I don't know. You know, I was in the Pentagon on 9-11. I don't want to overplay that. Um, but that's a thing. Um, I commanded during high operations in Iraq and Afghanistan and did multiple deployments. Um, my, uh, my unit, um, did a lot of angel flights where we are the first um, part of the journey for someone who's fallen to get back to the United States. I'm Irish. I'm not afraid to cry in, in front of anybody, by the way. So, you know, when you start laying those out, you know, what I thought was just a casual, 
stop in and 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 have a chat turned out to be you know sessions full of things to talk about sure. and i'm a better person for it and so the way i describe it to in you know even to this audience here i'd say there are some people that are hearing what i'm saying right now and they and without identifying themselves have been through the exact same thing that i've been through and are better for it there are some people that are listening to me right now that um that uh are good perhaps been through similar experiences and don't need the chat and that's all cool too and there's some people right now even in this room listening to me wondering if they can generate the courage to do exactly what kendra did and i did and i'm here to tell you if i can do it if she can do it so can you and the hardest part the hardest part of the whole journey the journey is the very first conversation with yourself and once you decide to make that action the weight comes off your shoulders thank you very much um uh, sure absolutely yes so one of the small privileges i have as being moderator is that i have had the opportunity to assign them some homework <laughs> And um, they have all done their homework, and now we're going to turn to their reports. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I asked everybody to do is if they would listen to each other's episode of the podcast. Uh, and I'm interested to know if you had any questions you wanted to ask or any takeaways that you wanted to share specifically. So can we start with you, Kendra? You listened to General Minahan's episode. Yes. <laughs> um... One of the first things I said to the general when I met him was, I loved your episode. I listened to it so many times. Um, and it's so true. I really, truly loved your episode. Um, well, I started peppering the general with some of my questions earlier, but um, I have two questions if that's okay. So the first one, um, as someone who is, we'll say, a rising business leader, <laughs> um, aspiring rising business leader, I'm so curious what you would say to leaders in my organization, excuse me, leaders in my organization who um, want so desperately, want to say something about the power of seeking um, mental health treatment, whatever that may be, um, but are afraid to do it. You described the following three days as the most terrifying three days, but you know, what would you say to yeah. someone in that position to give them the courage to do it? Right. Um, I'd say a couple things. You know, first, um, you know, the contributions to the organization um, and the organization, you know, is a team and the team has a goal and the best value you can get out of the teammates is their individualism, you know, as long as it supports you know the team's objectives hopefully that makes sense so so we your your value to the organization is not dependent and the way i describe it to my team is it doesn't matter if you're in the cockpit on the pointy end uh, of the mission your 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 value um, is based on you doing your job playing your role and and getting it right um so so there there is a lot um for individuals to do and you're describing them you know as you came onto the team you're describing very high standards I mean, if people want to be on a team with high standards and high standards and high morale and high quality can exist together. Mm -hmm. um, but it should never come at the expense of um, your valuization in a negative way. And so the way I would describe it to these is, is I would say, you know, first of all, if you're comparing my journey to yours, I would not expect everyone to go tweet their mental health appointment. <laughs> Um, um, you know, in the public spaces. So there are delicate ways um, to get after, um, you know, this type of help that can preserve the dignity and preserve the individuality and also preserve what the institution that you're working for needs to get after. So when I say lower stigma, this is a very delicate thing. Some of our organizations in the military start with a roll call very old school like in the movies everybody's lined up take and roll who's here minahan where's he at he's in a mental health appointment this is how delicate it is what does the reaction of the rest of the teammates do when they know minahan's not there and they're going to have to work harder because he's in a mental health appointment do they go 
I can't believe he's missed again. And you've just showed what to everybody else in that roll call? You've showed that if you seek help, there's a stigma attached with that. Or does the supervisor not even let it get to that point and say, awesome, hey, he's good, he'll be back, and I'm certain he'll have something he can share with us that make us all better. And, you know, you, you come with me, we're going to cover down on, on what Minahan had to cover down. The other thing I'm really getting after is this increased access and options. You know, there are more options out there besides just going to a mental health provider. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we're really doing is this, uh, is this peer counseling, certifying peers so that there are trusted agents within an organization where it doesn't have quite the barriers of, you know, where do you park? How do you get there? When do you sit in this, in this uh, waiting room? And can you just sit down with someone that's really good to talk to? Mm -hmm. And uh, it turns out there's a lot of people that want to help that way. And so um, and then I would, I would end with this. I would end with saying, to get to me now, you have to go through me then. This is what, I, this is what came to me in your podcast. To get to me now, you have to go through, through me then. And, and while I am my harshest critic, you also have to give yourself grace. You know? And you have to learn to say, hey, look, I know, uh, you know I may not meeting the perfection standard, but that's okay. And the last thing anybody needs is a negative outcome when it comes to mental health. And so we're all cheering you on when it comes to, you know, if you need to, you know, run through either a peer or a mental health provider. Um, but it's essential to this organization's success that you do that. So we're actually going to help you do it. I feel like that was too babbly. Yeah, that's but great. It was a... No, that's great. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Well, and now I, I want to ask you, uh, General, you listened to Kendra's yes. episode, and I wondered if you had a takeaway or a question. I did, and I shared this with Kendra earlier, and, and then you all during this session already is, I, you know, I found the courage to have the internal talk in, incredibly inspiring. And the climate within that organization where your manager takes that, you know, you know, just, you know, I'm certain is, you know, as I was visualizing what that looked like, you know, that's probably not on the calendar that says, hey, I'm going to talk to, Ken, to Kendra about her challenges when it comes to imposter syndrome, so she's actually ready to do it. So I'm envisioning this hustle and bustle New York office, and all of a sudden you're there, and then you're, you're, being, you're taking advantage of the courage, and you, and, you, and you let it go. I actually called it a quick chat. On yeah. The calendar invite. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. You know, so the ability of her to catch that quickly and make it such a positive right. event, uh, incredibly cool. So what did that teach you would be my question. When, you, when your manager supervisor took that fastball and turned it into such a positive statement, what, what did that teach you that's probably beyond you know, what you learn in an academic environment, you see the real world happening before you? That moment taught me so much about leadership and that leadership, the core of great leadership is leading with courage and grace and bravery. And she, you know, she's the president of the division. She has a lot of things to do in a day. <laughs> um, and yet she took time to really talk to me and get to the root of what was going on and shared with me that um, life happens to us all in one way or another. Um, and she really instilled in me this idea that we are not, and I, I knew this before because Olin, we're a values-based, data-driven um, program. And so I thought about this quite a bit during my MBA that, you know, we're not, employees aren't numbers, we're, we're people. We have lives to live. We bring our lives to work sometimes. And the delineation between work and life, it, it continues to get blurred in this weird, you know, hybrid environment. And so um, we, at the end of the day, are all people. And you have to be kind and lead with empathy. And sometimes that means leaving, leading with bravery and some vulnerability. Um, but she really showed me that the heart of great leadership is how you treat your people. Do they feel valued? Do they feel seen? Do they feel respected? Um, do they feel valued? That to me was, I just left feeling so valued. Um, so yeah, she's, 
She's one of the most amazing people I've ever met. And I feel so, so grateful that I had the chance to learn from her. Great, great. Hannah, you and I spoke specifically for Kendra's episode, but I know you've had a chance to listen to both of them. And I wondered if you had any takeaways or questions specifically you wanted to pose. Yeah, yeah. So I'm curious how I, in your episode, you talked about there were sometimes moments where this imposter phenomenon comes up more often. And I'm curious to know um, what are those contexts and in those moments, what do you do to kind of mitigate those, those feelings in those moments? Ooh, that is such a vulnerable question. <laughs> um, I am competitive with myself. I don't love being competitive with other people. And that isn't necessarily the way beauty works sometimes. Mm. <laughs> um, and so I feel it most when I feel like I need to be competitive mm. with other people. Um, and the way that it presents itself is almost physical. Like I'm almost feeling it now, just talking about it. Um, and then I have to start talking to myself. And what I say to myself is um, something I'm going to try not to get emotional, but my, um, my mom passed away when I was in business school and she left me um, basically a, a prayer that I didn't realize she, she was like writing down prayers. And um, I happened to find them and I said, oh, let me read a few of these. And I remember calling her the day that my internship was rescinded with L'Oreal. And um, I called her distraught and she's in my, my mom was so like, it's going to be fine, you know, stop crying and figure it out. She was very nurturing, but also was like, she had a lot of faith in me. <laughs> but um, she wrote a prayer for me. Um, and it said, please, Lord, let everything be okay for Kendra with L'Oreal. And I saw it at a time that I had no idea if I'd be going back or anything, but um, I remembered that that existed about three months before I started at L'Oreal. And in the moments, sorry, I'm not Irish, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> my last name is, <laughs> um, you know, in the moments where I really feel like I'm not supposed to be here or am I the right person? I remember that note. And so that's one of the things that I do immediately. And that reminds me that I am where I'm supposed to be and I'm doing the things that I'm supposed to be doing. And the second that I'm not doing well, trust me, someone in my, in my organization will tell me. <laughs> and that hasn't happened yet, so I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> that's beautiful, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I wonder anything you yeah, wanted to share. Yeah, on a share. more light, and perhaps more lighthearted, perhaps not. But do you have a plan for another tweet? And if so, what would it be about? That's what I'm curious. Of course I have a plan for another tweet. <laughs> um, you know, I, I want to make sure, you know, th there's always plans for tweets, um, but let be specific about the mental health. Um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to do theater when it comes to the approach, uh, for mental health. So, you know, there are almost daily reminders that, you know, of the, the ultimate negative outcome when it comes to mental health in the military. And so, you know, the grind underneath the tweets is actually what's most important now. What's the grind underneath the tweets? The grind underneath the tweets is a relentless positive message when it comes to mind body craft. The grind underneath the tweets is a relentless uh, eliminate stigma, lower barriers, increase access and options. And options is what I'm really driving hard on. Um, you know, can you can you uh, can you establish a peer uh, a peer type of um, a, a peer type counseling? uh place on a base you know we just did this there's a there's a thing called sean's house which was at an airbase that we have in dover 
which is in Delaware. And it's a house off base where peers man it and you can just go in there 24 seven and ask a question and be surrounded by people that are trained to help you. And we've just moved that to a Sean's room in New Jersey, which is now a room on the base that's open 24 seven that's staffed by peers. And so the grind underneath it to build that confidence that airmen can have and, and step into something that can help them no matter what it is, whether it's the, the hospital, a peer, a commander, a first sergeant, a chief like Brinkley, um, you know, even reaching out to a parent and then a parent would know who to reach to um, that can pierce through those those distances and stuff. So, um, you know, I don't, I'm not necessarily think that that's something to tweet about, um, but but the message that's going on underneath it is absolutely something to exclaim. Wonderful. You know, I want to get to some questions from the audience, but before we do, let me just ask you, Hannah, I wonder if you could talk in sort of as we reflect on what we've been discussing, whether there are features of organizations that encourage a sense of belonging, bringing one's whole self. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. Um, I would say there's sort of three main ways in which organizations can increase people's feeling of belonging, also increase people's feeling like they can speak to their leader and voice concerns. Uh, one is fostering what's called a growth mindset. So making sure people understand that skills and abilities aren't just some things some people have and some people don't, but really you grow and you learn over time. Uh, the second is what I would call a belongingness intervention, which is making sure people realize that feelings of not belonging or feelings of mental health struggles are normal, right? This is something everyone goes through. Uh, and when you feel like other people are going through it as well, you're more likely to seek the resources you need. And then the last is what I think your leader did really well, which was uh, acknowledge that differences are a strength. So when we see employees who have different skills and abilities, that's something we want to celebrate uh, and we want to leverage those differences, uh, which we know will increase performance in our larger organization. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you to Kendra and Mike. I appreciate everything you've been saying, but we're not done. <laughs> now is the chance if uh, anybody in our uh, online audience or the audience here has questions, um, please let us know. And before you ask your question, please wait for somebody to bring a microphone to you. Does anybody have any? Yes. Hi, uh, thank you for being here. First of all, it was amazing uh, you know, listening to all of you. So uh, my question goes around uh, during your low moments or when you are at, when you are going through that particular phase, sometimes there are two different kinds of conversations which are going in. One is the conversations with your heart and second is the conversation with your mind. So which, which one generally do you follow? And this question is open to all of you. Jump ball. I love that question. <laughs> um, I really do because one of my good friends from business school, uh, Tim Brand, uh, Timmy asked me, we talked about this one time and Timmy said to me like, well, are, do you feel insecure? As in like, are there things that you just genuinely don't know? And like, you're concerned because you don't know them? I was like, well, yeah, I don't know everything. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but in that moment, my response, like, I thought to myself, wait a minute, are there like skills that I need to shore up that would help me feel more confident, which I think is that conversation with your brain. And then there are moments of, you know, you're telling yourself you don't need to be here, which is kind of an irrational thought, right? Like no one knows everything. So you have some skills you want to shore up. Great. I think that goes to having a growth mindset. Um, there's anything an MBA can do. Let's learn something very quickly um, and with um, and uh, pretty comprehensively. So, you know, I think that's I, I can't give you a ratio of like, you know, heart to, to mind, but I do sometimes have to take a step back and say, to what extent is this you feeling insecure because you don't know X, Y, Z? 
and you need to become stronger at that. And that's a muscle that I feel very comfortable flexing and asking people around me like to validate that if I am wa- un- if I'm wavering for some reason. Um, but I found more times than not it was the heart that I was just being very um, unkind to myself. And the other thing you said to me when we had the podcast conversation was, I think the phrase you said was, my brain is not my, fr- is not oh my, my friend. Oh my gosh, yes. And it was not. My brain was not my friend. <laughs> um, my brain was not my friend, but I think it was really stemming from my heart, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. But your brain is so powerful. Anybody else have a... Oh, here's a question down here. This is for the general. How do you think your squadron commanders and your wing commanders view getting help? And for those that aren't on page with you, what are you doing to change it? Right. Good question. Um, I think there's high resonance for the squadron commanders and the wing commanders. Um, you know, but I also understand that there's, you know, as I described the three categories of people that may be in this audience, you know, there's some that can identify, there's some that, you know, are good to go, and there's some are wondering if they can generate the courage. So I realize that it's not high resonance uh, for 100% of the echelon. There is no doubt. Uh, and, and, and that's okay. Um, so when you have the numbers of challenges when it comes to the negative outcome, it is hard to distance yourself from the realities of needing to bring mind up to the same level as body and craft. So what I'm describing here is, is what was alluded to earlier by Kurt is, is the suicide. And, and that is squadron commander and wing commander business. And so you, you cannot uh, be a squadron commander or wing commander in the echelon now and, and be distanced from the realities of the negative outcome. So I think there's high resonance when it comes to the command echelon. And for those not in the military, you know, th- that's, that describes the, the, the middle management of, of the Air Force when we're talking about squadron and wing commanders, very talented uh, individuals that have a lot of responsibility, both in terms of the airmen uh, that are in their units and also the missions that they need to perform. So, um, you know, there, there is some consistency of deliberate messaging here that has to be um, from from the heart it needs to be uh, genuine um, is you know is what I would have used when I was growing up I used genuine you know vulnerable is now now the term now Um, but but there has got to be a genuine nature from which we're having this conversation so I heard that earlier question I I don't talk to myself in terms of my heart and my, my, my brain, I'll go back and study that tonight and figure out if I need to add that to the portfolio here. But what I always cage myself in terms of what am I doing to support the airmen and what am I doing to support the mission? So when we think in terms of those, those are commander responsibilities and, and, and therefore those are the highest priority things that we need to get after. And having frank conversations about the good and the bad and the ugly of this business um, is essential. And then establishing the environment where the people that perhaps don't feel aligned can actually put that on the table and respectfully dissent and add their thoughts, their contribution, their, their angle um, is absolutely something that needs to happen. So, you know, and it's, the, it's an easy thing to say that you want to hear the contrary argument, okay? And it's another thing to sit at the head of the table and actually hear the contrary argument. And, and how do commanders react to that? Do they bristle? Do they, do they have nonverbals that bow up? And perhaps the nonverbals are contrary to, to the words that are coming out of their, their mouth. All these things matter in this conversation. So, you know, creating the environment where the real conversation can happen so that you hear all sides of the equation. And what, this is what I've learned after, you know, over three decades of doing this. There is not a one fix solution to any of this. Humans are complicated, humans are imperfect, and therefore I am willing to entertain anything on the table. If you said that the color of my socks would help me get after mission and taking care of airmen, I would change them tomorrow to to do that. And so that goes to 
all of the things that need to be put on uh, to consider to, to take care of uh, the airmen and the mission. So I think I answered your question, but I'll go to you. Did I answer your question? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my colleague in the back with the foam finger, Elizabeth Flora, is speaking for our online audience, and I saw you waving. Did, did you have a question back there, Elizabeth? Um, I do. Um, it kind of, I think, piggybacks off of what the general just spoke about, but it was, are all branches of the military on board with the attitude that it's a sign of strength to seek middle, mental health treatment or would this be held against some people when they're evaluated for a promotion? Much work's been done to eliminate the stigma, but I don't think everyone agrees. Yeah, I, I would agree with that statement. You know, there's a lot of work that's been done on eliminating, eliminating the stigma. Um, and and, the, and the, I don't think there's a finish line when it comes to eliminating the stigma. So I, I can't speak for all the branches, but I've got a lot of time serving in the joint community. Um, and so I'll make, I'll make comments. We've all been through enormous amount of challenges over the last two decades. And, you know, the, the, the pace of operations when it comes to Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, you know, even now to, at this very moment, you know, there's people in harm's way uh, over Iraq, Syria. Um, there's, you know, the team that, that I get to, uh, to be with are doing all the support for Ukraine right now. Um, the president and, you know, there's presidential travel and there's, there's very high, no fail things that go on each and every day. And that extends to every service. So whether you're a soldier, sailor, airman, marine, or guardian, um, you know, there is, uh, you know, there is a uh, need to get after mind, body, craft, and warrior heart, whatever they call for it. When you hang around the joint team, which is the all service team, you you understand that the entire team is very strong you also understand that they put an enormous amount on the line when it comes to what this nation demands of its military and so therefore there is a need amongst every service to get after this when you look at the negative outcomes you know it doesn't it, it doesn't it's not um it's not confined to one service it's spread out amongst all the services so uh, I do believe that we still need to attack the stigma. I think that the leadership of every service understands that, as do the people that serve within that within those services, and um, and they've got to make it work for them, whatever it is. I'm describing to you what I'm trying to make work for Air Mobility Command. It might be different for what the Marines would use or for what the Army use, but I don't think that you could argue uh, that anybody would argue that the foundational items within that support that need to happen are any different depending on your service. Hopefully that answered the question. Thank you. Any other questions? I see another one back here. Um, hi, thank you for being here today. I had a question that uh, since your chief was, uh, he told you to put uh, mental on, on your point, uh, yeah. in calendar and uh, you were approached with open um, conversation when you had some troubles, but uh, certain times people don't have that liberty that uh, the leaders are so open to right. uh, your problems and uh, you instead, like if you voice it, get shut as well. So in certain situations like these, you start to doubt yourself further. How do you combat that and in certain situations? I think it's a, it's a great question and, the, and herein lies the challenge, right? You know, is that a lot of these questions are, are handled in, quiet places without a whole, um, you know, without the limelight, if you will, or perhaps um, uh, the experienced leadership that understands this. And, you know, but that's where the, that's, those are the conversations we need to win. I mean, I'll, I'll just be frank, we need to win those conversations. And so I need to arm um, every airman within my echelon with the ability to receive uh, a question or a comment or an approach and to be able to have the same wonderful outcome uh, that Kendra's manager had, you know, and to be able to say, hey, look, I'm, I don't know what to do here, but I'm going to get you somebody that can help. Or I do know what to do, do here and just follow me. And, you know, let me call my commander. Let me call my first sergeant. Let me call my chief. Let me call your wife. Let me call your, your best friend that I know that you share an apartment with, you name it. I mean, there's a, no, there's a thousand ways to have a positive outcome as opposed to, 
hey man, suck it up. Or, hey, look, I don't know what you're talking about. Go talk to, go find someone else. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll share a very, uh, we'll see if I can get it out. Um, when I was the vice wing commander at Travis, a young man committed suicide. He called, uh, he, he called his, he was a, a fire, a fireman. And he called the fire department and said, hey, do you have the number for the chaplain? And the individual that took the phone call said, yeah, hold on, let me look it up. And then that individual said, never mind, I'll, I'll find it, hung up the phone, shot himself with the, with the rifle his grandfather gave him. Okay, so that conversation is not... Um, an indictment on the person that took the phone call. He was doing everything right and still had a negative outcome. But it's those conversations are the ones that we have to just keep going after and try to win individual at individual at individual. Um, you know, if the suicide rate went down to one, it's still one too many. And if the suicide rate went down to zero, we still have work to do. That's how complicated humans are. You can do everything right and still have a negative outcome. Or you can do everything wrong and have a positive outcome. And we've got to be able to handle everything from those book stops and in the middle when it comes to it. So I think your question was very good. Hopefully I answered it. I think we could probably get in one more very quick question if anybody has one. All right, I guess we're good then. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much to Hannah, Mike and Kendra for being here, for sharing your stories. Uh, I'm just so thrilled to have the chance to see you all in person. Um, we didn't get that chance when we talked for the podcast. Um, I, I want to, uh, speaking of the podcast, I would like to just invite everybody here to go to your podcasting app and search for On Principle if you liked hearing these stories and would like to hear more like them. Uh, On Principle is about those pivotal moments, those oh shoot moments that business leaders confront how they confront them, what we can learn from them. And I hope you will take the opportunity to hear some of those uh, if, you, if you're interested. Um, can we give uh, everybody a big hand here first? Thank you. Now, before, before we go, I would like to introduce my colleague, Carrie Donnelly from, our, from Olin's Graduate Programs Office, who has just a couple of words to say before she closes us out. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Kurt. Um, hi, my name is Carrie Donnelly. I am with Wash U Olin's graduate admissions team. And I want to offer another thank you to Kurt, Kendra, Hannah, and the general for a great discussion. Uh, hearing how you were able to face challenges, be vulnerable, be genuine, um, and stay true to your principles is inspiring. Uh, today's discussion aligns with the kind of leadership students develop here at Wash U Olin, particularly in our graduate programs. A Wash U Olin MBA helps prepare students to be values-based, data-driven leaders and equips them to thrive in a global and changing world. We offer our MBA in three part-time formats for working professionals. Our online MBA is 100% online and was designed for those who aim to use digital technology as business strategy. Our professional MBA program was designed for those who are uh, looking for a flexible schedule and want to build their network and accelerate their careers. And our executive MBA program focuses on honing leadership skills and includes professional coaching with certified coaches. We invite you to learn more about these programs at our next information session, Professional Programs, a Spotlight on Faculty, on September 27th at 5 p.m. We are uh, sharing a, a QR code there for registration, and there's also a link in the chat. Um, we also would like to invite you to check out our website for our next Leadership Perspectives event. And before we all part this evening, we'd like to ask everyone to please join us out here in the Frick Forum for refreshments and networking. Thank you all, and thank you again to our panel for being here, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>